Thank you, Boyer. <laughs> we have no musician. We have no volume. But we all are still here doing what God is asking us to do. Welcome to St. Peter's. The little church with the big heart in the desert. We do what we need to do when we have to. We all take our parts and do what God, God is guiding us to do. My name is Helen Noel. I'm the Bishop Warden of St. Peter's Pastor. We welcome you to service today, and we ask you to serve yourself in preparation for worshiping. Grant us the fullness of your grace, 
that we, running to obtain your promises, may become partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated to the reading. Then he prayed again, and heaven made rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. 
My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Carpenter will know is at St. Wilfred's Church in Huntington Beach, California. And my focus uh, was on those three directives. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your feet cause you to sin, stumble, cut them off. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. You should have heard that soon. <laughs> so now I just warn you that whatever it might be that causes you to sin, think about what it would be like if you had to cut it off. Okay. But my sermon today is not really a sermon. I, I'm finding it when I sit here, it's easier to give more of a conversational um, and if you were paying attention to the first lesson from the book of Esther, did any of it make sense to you? Um, one of my problems with our fairly recent revised common lectionary, um, the compilers of this lectionary wanted to include stories of more women, which is good for the Bible. Um, and as a result, the Old Testament lesson rarely nowadays has anything to do with what the gospel is saying, which it used to. It was a lot easier for preachers back then. Um, but the way they chalked up the very few, relatively few, um, verses from Esther, it, it didn't make sense to me unless you really knew the story of Esther. So how many of you know the story of Esther? Okay, one. <laughs> well, listen up, folks. Okay. So, um, we start with an introduction to Asuerzus, who we also in the Greek may remember his name is Xerxes, Xerxes the first, okay? And um, this is the Persian king whose capital is, was at Persepolis, um, but the citadel of Susa that he mentions in the in this gospel was his winter residence and it was about 200 miles northeast of Babylon. So it's in the Persian Empire. Um, now the king has banquets that are known, widely known, as being very lavish, very elaborate. And they go on for days. Um, and he had a wife named Vashti, and she would give a banquet for the women. Of course, the king's banquet would be only for the men. So the queen would have a banquet for the women, the wives, and whoever, female, is around, to correspond with the king's feast. But on one occasion, and we're not given any reason why, um, Vashti refuses to go. And this is how it says in the, in the gospel. On our seventh day, when the king was married with wine, he commanded his eunuchs um, to attend the king to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing the royal crown, in order to show the people and the officials her beauty for she was fair to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, conveyed by the eunuchs. At this, the king was enraged, and his anger burned within him. As I say, there's no reason given why she used to do all the banquets, but for some reason she refused here. And that we can probably take it that it's just a way to move the story along. 
and to eventually bring Esther into the picture before she will die. Okay. So the king, in his anger, consults with his lawyers about what to do with Vashti. And one of them suggested, um, not only has Queen Vashti done wrong to the king, but also to all the officials and all the people who are in the province of the king of Suerces. In other words, the king. For this deed, the queen will be made known to all women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands, since they will say, King Asuerus has commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Medea, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will rebel against the king's official, and they will, there will be no end of contempt and wrath. Okay, so if Queen Vashti can do this, then all the women are going to get this idea and they're going to defy their husbands. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> the royal order goes out banishing Vashti. But this left the king without a queen. So, orders went out through all the 120 some odd provinces of this kingdom that each was to send all the most beautiful young virgins to Susa so that the king could choose his next queen. Sounds to me like a Persian version of this America, I should think. <laughs> Now, at the time, a Jew named Mordecai was living in Susa, the city of the king. His ancestors had been taken from Jerusalem during what we came to know as a Babylonian captivity. And Mordecai had brought up Esther, who was his cousin, but also an orphan. Um, her parents, uh, he was related to her father, um, had been killed during this Babylonian captivity. When her parents had died, Mordecai then actually adopted Esther, so she was legally, by now, his daughter. Now, of course, Esther was beautiful. Why would we need to look at her if she wasn't? So she was one of the young women taken into the king's palace to see if she would find favor with the king. Um, only there was uh, um, there was one problem because Esther did not reveal her people or kindred, or Mordecai had charged her not to, which means. Esther didn't tell the king that she was a Jew. So, now Mordecai sort of hangs around the palace to see how Esther is managing. And Esther is brought into the harem and takes about a year to learn how to do all the cosmetics and the hair and the clothes and then each of the young women from all of these provinces were free for the king. Um, and of course, it was Esther, out of all the women, who found favor with the king. And so she was to be crowned as the new queen. Now, as I said, Mordecai was sort of hanging around the palace so he could keep an eye on Esther to make sure everything was going okay with her. And at one point, he overhears two of the king's household plotting to assassinate the king. He told Esther of the plot, and she told the king. And the attempt to kill the king was thwarted. After this, 
the king promoted one of his household, a man named Haman. You might remember hearing Haman in the passage today. And he was raised to a position over all of the king's other courtiers. The king was tough at all. There were not all one. And um, Haman then, in his humility, decreed that everyone had to bow down and give obeisance to him. So the courtiers bowed down to Haman, except for Mordecai. Mordecai would not bow down and do obeisance. And here it says, the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? When they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's word would avail, for he had told him that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or do obeisance to him, Haman was infuriated. But he thought it beneath him to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So, having been told who Mordecai's people were, the Jews, Haman plotted to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom of Osiris. Sounds a little bit like overkill to me. Unintended. <laughs> Now, in order to bring about this mass slaughter of the Jews, Haman was sly enough not to order it himself. But he told the king that this certain people scattered throughout the provinces did not keep the laws of the king, which, of course, was totally inappropriate for the king to tolerate. But with Haman, Haman would see to the destruction of all of these people. So orders were drawn up and distributed throughout the kingdom. Corridors went to each province. Orders, quote, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day and then to plunder their goods. Nice guy, Haman. When Mordecai heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went throughout the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. Now Esther's servants told her about Mordecai, so she sent one of her servants to find out what was happening and why. Mordecai told her about the decree instigated by Haman to have all the Jews killed. And he even gave Esther's servant a copy of the decree that the king had authorized to show to him. Now, it was a law at the court that no one could go in to the king, to the king's inner court, um, unless they were called, unless the king gave them permission. <coughs> Even the queen had to obey the law, whose disobedience would mean death. People seem to like death a lot. Here. <laughs> So Esther told Mordecai to gather all the Jews in Susa and hold a three-day fast and pray on her behalf. And after those three days, she would go to the king, saying, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So she felt it was so important that the king be made aware of what Haman was demanding, the death of all the Jews in the kingdom, that she had to let the king know. When Esther 
wearing her royal robes. This gal's not dumb. Um, she went to the court on the third day, and when the king saw her, she won his favor, and he invited her to approach. That night, well, and she tells him what's happening. That night, the king could not sleep. So he gave orders to bring the records, all of the annals that are, had been kept of all of the um, actions taken by the court to be read to him. These annals contained a record of how Mordecai had alerted the king's courtiers about the plot to assassinate him. He didn't know it was Mordecai who had done that. Um, and he asked what honor or distinction had been bestowed on Mordecai, but the servant said that nothing had been done for him. The king said, who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to speak to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that he had prepared for him because Mordecai would be down to him. Um, so the king's servants told him, Haman is there standing in the court. The king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king said to him, what shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor? Haman said to him, whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king wishes to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse that the king has ridden with a royal crown on its head. Let the robe and the horse be handed over to one of the king's most noble officials. Let him robe the man whom the king wishes to honor, and let him conduct the man on horseback through the open square of the city, proclaiming before him, thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. <laughs> then the king said to Haman, Quickly, take the robes and the horse, as you have said, and do so to the Jew Mordecai, who sits at the king's gate. <laughs> <laughs> Leave out nothing that you have mentioned. So Haman took the robes and the horse and rode to Mordecai and led him riding through the open square of the city, proclaiming, Thus shall it be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Fox him. <laughs> okay, so Haman then was telling his wife and his friends what had happened when one of the king's servants comes to bring Haman um, to Queen Esther's banquet. Esther has more up her sleeve. The king is going to be giving a big banquet for all of his officials, all of the notaries throughout the land. And the queen now is going to give her own banquet. And this is where our lesson for today's Sunday begins in your leaflet. So the king asks her, uh, as he, he, there were two banquets actually. So at the first banquet, he had asked her what her petition would be and what does she request. Apparently these were, were two different things, but um, even though they sound alike to us. So, um, Esther pleads, her petition is for her own life and for the lives of all of her people, the Jews. And this is the first time the king's heard her. she's a Jew. Um, when the king asks who is responsible for this order to kill the Jews, 
Esther names Haman. The king was in a rage, and after he had a little time to cool off, he walked in the garden. One of his servants, Harbona, um, tells him about the gallows that Haman had set up in preparation for hanging Mordecai. Turn around, fair play. So the king ordered Haman to be hanged on the gallows he had set up for Mordecai. Then Esther again went to the king to plead for her people that the king would revoke the order that had gone out throughout his kingdom to kill all the Jews. Now, it says in our passage that once the king has decreed something and it's sealed with his seal, it cannot be revoked. So he cannot do what Esther is asking. But there's a way around it. Um, the king orders such a decree to go out, but this time not from Haman, but from Mordecai, who the king has raised in status to now take Haman's place as his lead courtier. So now it goes out under Mordecai's name, but with the seal of the king. Um, and by these letters of the decree, the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to assemble and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them with their children and women and to plunder their goods on a single day throughout all the provinces of King Oswerzis on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adon. So the king couldn't revoke the original decree to kill all the Jews, but he replaced it with this new decree which supersedes anything it came before, giving the Jews permission to kill all of those who would have killed them. Okay. It's not such a nice story. But anyway, that's what happened. <laughs> Unfortunately, the story is not necessarily one of justice and goodwill, obviously. While the killing of the Jews was averted, the Jews were permitted to take revenge on their enemies. And for two days, after the first day, they were so successful, they asked the king to have another day in the church. They did slaughter throughout all the kingdom all those who had been against them before. For this reason, those two days, and they're the 14th and 15th of the Jewish month of Aeon, would henceforth be kept every year as days of celebration and feasting, both for sending gifts of food to one another and presents to the poor, unquote. And this is, to this day, the Jewish feast known as Purim. This is the only one of the official days of the Jewish calendar that are not based in Mosaic law, the laws of Moses. But it was instigated by Andrew Esther. So now you know about the story of Esther and Mordecai. Um, to our ears, it sounds pretty gruesome and unchristian, of course. <laughs> um, that the Jews' revenge on their enemy would be so thorough and so cruel. But that's how the world was at that time. Um, and my question to you is, have we progressed very far since then? Has the coming of Christ with his message of love your enemies made any difference? 
Have we put off hating whole groups of people based only on their being different from us, of a different religion, of a different political event, or a different color or gender, or whatsoever trait you want to name? Are we any different? Then I'd like to refer you back to the opening line of our comic for today. Begins, God, you declared your almighty power chiefly in showing what? Who can read it for me? Mercy and pity. Mercy and pity. When in your surroundings, as well as in a wider world, are we as Christians being called to follow God, Jesus' example, by showing mercy and pity to those in distress. Who can name a couple examples? Where we find this? Where we want to take action? Sometimes it won't be just as a single individual that you can do this, although there are plenty of opportunities but where are we as a nation? We are going to be right now at the Rio Grande at the river where we have the Marcy with the Haitian Marcy. Right. What horrific video that was of the border agents on horseback with ropes or rains or whatever it was that they were using to beat the Haitians across the river? <coughs> and how can we justify sending these people, no matter how many? Because international law under which we supposedly function says that we are to accept these people, these refugees who are fleeing from either hate or oppression or famine. And yet what do we do? We load them up planes and send them right back where they began. And that's one example that's so prevalent in our hearts and minds right now. But think also just in your day-to-day -day activity with people. When you see someone being slighted or even physically abused because of their faith, the way they look, do they have the same eye shape as we do? Do they have the same skin color as we do? This is a story of Haman and Mordecai and Esther all over again. Now we don't need to be as brutal in the seeking revenge, but there is room for mercy and pity, compassion and love.
Gail, Noodles, Floyd, Katie, Joe, Tom, Marianne, Ray, Wesley, Kathy, Ruby, Justice, Robin, Cody, Kevin, Angela. At this time, you may add your own intercession silently or loud. For the Haitian refugees. May they experience your healing love. And for the members of our armed forces serving at home and abroad, yours, Lord, is the kingdom. We pray that all who have wearily struggled to death may know the joy of burdens laid down and new, lasting, life-transforming them through the eternal love of God. We pray today for the repose of the soul of Terry, Gordon, Jean. You may add your own petitions now. We pray that we may find new joy in living and serving freely, without thanks, rejoicing in the privilege of following Jesus. We give thanks for those celebrating their birthdays and anniversaries today and this week. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. Yours, Yours is the power and the glory. In the diocese cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Stephen's Douglas. We acknowledge the traditional peoples of this land on which we stand, and we pay our respects to them for their care of this land. Receive us, O God, as you received the child in Capernaum, for we yearn for your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. <coughs>
travel, when any of us miss right now, and that you come and say you back to us. We need you in God's hands. And we ask you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
body of Christ the bread of heaven. The 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 body of Christ the bread of heaven.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.